Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Sharon Florentine. Welcome to today's webinar, Five R's, Which Strategy is Right for Your Migration to Google Cloud, brought to you by Splunk and Google. We have an awesome webinar for you today, but before we get started, I need to go through some housekeeping items with you. First, please remember that the session is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of it, you'll be able to go back and watch it again. We will send you an email with instructions for accessing the webinar on demand, or you can always visit us at devops.com slash webinars, and it will be there for you as well. We are taking questions throughout the presentation, so you can use the Q&A tab on your console to submit questions at any time. We will try to get to as many as possible at the end of the presentation. Finally, stick around till the end when we do our drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. And if you stick around, you'll see if you are a winner. All right, with that, I am pleased to turn things over to our speakers today. Greg Leffler is an observability practitioner director at Splunk, and Brian Farnham is a customer engineer with infrastructure modernization at Google. I'm going to turn my camera and my microphone off and let them take it away. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar with Google Cloud and Splunk. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the five R's, which strategy is right for your application modernization and migration to Google Cloud. Uh, we have a really full agenda today and we're excited to share all this information with you. In addition to the five R's, we have five agenda items we're going to cover today. Uh, the first thing we're going to discuss is the cloud journey uh, that companies are going through and the new requirements for that cloud journey, the five R's of cloud migration, the consequence of these five R's and how that evolves into the need for observability, uh, giving you a little understanding of Splunk observability, uh, and then uh, dive into how to migrate into Google Cloud uh, with Splunk, you know, embracing observability, putting all of it together, uh, but also really giving you a look into what the state of the art for Google Cloud is and how to make sure that you really get the most out of that migration to the cloud. For your speakers today, uh, I am Greg Leffler. I'm an observability practitioner at Splunk. Uh, I've been an SRE before. I've dealt with you know, the cloud migration uh, at some companies like eBay and LinkedIn, uh, so I'm familiar with why to move to the cloud and how to do it. Uh, and I'm your other speaker. I'm Brian Farnham. I'm a customer engineer here at Google Cloud. Uh, I've been working in the networking industry prior to Google Cloud for about 12 years. And of course, before we can dive into the content, we do have some boring legal stuff for you. During the course of this presentation, either one of us may make what the SEC considers forward-looking statements. Please base your purchasing decisions based on our products as they exist today, and not anything that we may tell you is coming in the future. You can read more on this slide. So let's just jump into it. Right? One of the things that I think is really common with companies talking about this cloud journey is that there's a lot of things that make up the need to do this cloud journey. And it's kind of a dizzying array of stuff that happens, right? Like there's a big confluence of circumstances, especially over the last year, uh, that caused a lot of a need to move stuff to the cloud, more, even more so than before. You know, this has been a trend for a while, but uh, with uncertainty around the economic condition, around the pandemic, uh, around this rise of remote work that came out of the pandemic, you know, all of those things definitely sort of got people driving uh, to do this migration to get onto the cloud to make their uh, digital experience easier and more uh, consistent with what other people in the industry are doing. You know, prior to the pandemic, prior to 2020, of course, there was the DevOps movement emerging. People were spending more time having their developers be closer to production, learning about how that works, getting some of the synergy together from why uh, the developers want to be in the operation space uh, and vice versa. There's an increased need for automation uh, and 
just a general increased use of the cloud because there are a lot of cost benefits and uh, ease of use benefits. If your application is written for the cloud, it scales effortlessly, and you know, there's a ton of huge benefits that make people want to do these cloud migrations. Uh, and there's even been you know, some work from, from Splunk and from others in the field to tell people about the need for observability that also has sort of driven people to the cloud. You can get observability in a much easier way in a cloud-native world uh, compared to doing it with some legacy installations. So when we talk about the cloud journey itself, uh, there's sort of a framework that we're going to use throughout this presentation and that's used in the industry. Uh, and it's been in use since 2010, which you know, is, is a lifetime in the technology context. Uh, but it's from a consulting agency, Gartner. Uh, and there are five approaches you can take to moving to the cloud. So I'm going to introduce what the five approaches are. And we'll talk a little bit about their pros and cons here in a second. But uh, you know, the easiest one sort of is rehost. Right? You take your existing application, you move it into the cloud, you don't change the architecture of the app at all. Right? It's just whatever you were running, you just literally pick it up and move it over to somewhere else. You don't do any changes to it. Uh, that you know, is sort of, that these are arranged from left to right sort of in order of how, how into the cloud you're getting. Right? So rehost is you know, the very elementary one of just removing our existing stuff up into the cloud. Uh, revise is to sometimes called replatform. The idea here is that you're moving your apps into the cloud without any major changes, but you are sort of picking up some of you know the service aspects of the cloud, right? You're not using everything, but you're using a few things. You know, you might change your storage backend to be a, a block store instead of what you were using before, something like that. Refactor is using the cloud provider as a service, right? So you're modifying your apps a little bit to more effectively embrace the things that you can get out of moving to the cloud. Everything before, you know, this refactor, revise, rehost are all sort of dipping your toes in the water level, right? But then when we get into rebuild and replace, right, this is when we're really talking about fully embracing that cloud journey and really going through with it in a full way. So if you rebuild, you know, kind of is explanatory in the name, right? You're rewriting your application from scratch. You're building in the cloud for the cloud. You're really doing a big bang where you say, hey, we're going to change everything so that we can fully take use of everything that the cloud offers us, right? So we have use of the scaling. We have use of the uh, infrastructure as code. We have use of their monitoring systems. Like everything that it does, we're going to use. Uh, this requires you to, you know, completely change how your app was built. Uh, you don't have to change the architecture or how the business logic, right? But you do have to change the services and how they operate. Uh, and then, of course, there is the, the sneaky last option there of replace uh, or repurchase, where you just go to assess, right? You buy something that is already in the cloud that does whatever you were doing, uh, and you just retire your old application and replace it with a new one. Uh, and this is, you know, this is a valid strategy if you were using a, a homegrown line of business app, and there's now a cloud service that does it for you. Yeah, buying a buying a cloud service is a totally good way to get your app up in the cloud, and mostly to remove the maintenance burden from you. Right? If somebody else is maintaining the code, somebody else is worrying about it scaling, somebody else is worrying about its uptime, you can instead focus on your core business. So like I said, you know, there are these five R's, and each one does have its pros and cons. I, I think thinking about sort of the, the easiest one to do is a rehost, right, where you just lift and shift. And some of the pros for this are, you know, it's fast, right? It's relatively inexpensive as far as the migration process itself, right? You don't have to spend time or money rewriting code or uh, figuring out how to get the best out of your, you know, cloud platform that you're moving to. You just figure out, okay, what does it need to run and just move it over there. So you don't need to do any code changes, no architecture changes, nothing like that. Uh, a big one from the finance perspective is that uh, in a rehost, you often are moving from CapEx to OpEx. And the, the reality of the way budgets work, you know, it may be more advantageous to you to have your application uh, cost move to OpEx rather than CapEx. This also can be done relatively quickly, uh, and it is a great way to move, you know, like a non-core, low-risk app is just, let's not spend a bunch of time making this perfect, let's just do it. Some of the cons of a rehost approach are that you, you do have these higher ongoing costs. Uh, a lot of companies will say, we're going to move to the cloud because it's cheaper. And it's only cheaper if you're really leveraging all of the tools and all of the platforms in the correct way. Right? Running 
uh, someone else's bare metal is obviously going to cost more than running your own bare metal, right? Because they have all the same expenses you did, plus they have to make some money. So uh, it may not be the best ideal, the best situation for really saving money. Uh, and certain applications that you built, you know, in the old way may not be scalable. Right? If your apps maintain state, uh, if your apps are, are you know, very complex, they may not scale the way that you think they would for moving them into the cloud. And one of the biggest ones really is that all of your legacy problems are just going to move right along with you. Plus, you may encounter new problems from the cloud platform or from your people's inexperience with the platform and that sort of thing. Uh, so it's really a low return bar, right? Rehosting is, you know, it's enough to check the box, but it's not the best idea. Revision is cost efficient. You know, you are making some minor changes. Uh, so you can save infrastructure, you can save software licenses. The operational overhead of a revision is less than of a refactor or a rebuild. Uh, but you do still make a few changes to help you optimize your spending a little bit better. Some of the downsides of this, there are dev expenses, right? You are paying a developer to do those revisions. Uh, testing becomes very complicated if you have uh, new parts of your code that also touch old parts of your code. Uh, when you actually do the migration itself, you know, is that a big thing that one day everything's moved? Are you still having some parts hosted elsewhere? How do you mesh those together? Uh, and then anytime you make a code change, there's a risk that there's going to be some issues. Uh, so you know, sort of the, the, less, the, the less cloud options are repost and revised, uh, and I'll let Brian address the ones that are actually moving more into the cloud. Thanks. So for the refactor, you're a little further along in your journey. You're kind of figuring out which applications you can take apart more and do more with, take more advantages of what a cloud can offer you. So uh, up front, it will cost more, but long term, because you are taking advantage of some of the cloud, what the cloud can offer you, you get more long term cost savings there. Uh, this is great because this is why people want to move to the cloud, right? And you can make your application more resilient, more scalable, and that's the biggest factor for a lot of people moving to the cloud. Some of the downsides to that are it is more expensive than rehost or revise initially, but uh, as mentioned earlier, long-term savings should be uh, viable with this option. There is larger risk, right? If you're just starting moving to the cloud, the more you change, the more risk that you're going to have. So you really need to take a look at which applications can be moved in which manner out of these five R's and pick that kind of appropriately. Uh, with Refactor, some new skill sets will obviously be required, right? We're now talking about more cloud-based technologies, you know, whether that's auto-scaling, uh, managed instance groups, things like that. Uh, for the rebuild option, that's even a further step along. You can start to think about changing the application in big steps and leaps here. So this is you know, a time that you can actually kind of up-level your organization here. They can really dive deep into those cloud technologies and get some high returns out of those cloud technologies. Now you're kind of fully rebuilding your application, starting sometimes from scratch, uh, and, and really leveraging what you can there for the cloud. It is obviously a much higher risk, uh, but this is going to give you kind of the biggest advantage for uh, an application that you're hosting uh, on the cloud. And, and the last option is to replace the application. Grade mentioned this. Uh, this is going to a full SaaS service. So this is, you don't need to scale your application. You don't need to maintain the application. You just simply use the application. This is where you want to take that burden off of your teams, your SRE teams, your DevOps teams, et cetera, and just focus on the business case. What are you going to get out of that application? Just be a user of it. It is... It does come with some risks. There are some vendor lock-in situations that could come about there. Uh, you can't customize it as much. Obviously, if you're building your own application, you can customize it as much as you can. Uh, but with a SaaS offering, those do become more lim uh, limited. So we talked a little bit about the pros and cons of each of the five ways you can do a cloud migration. And one of the things that's important to note is that any cloud migration you're going to do is going to increase the complexity of your architecture, uh, which creates uh, a ton of issues. And one of those issues that people notice right away are the web of complex interdependencies. 
that gets created when you move to the cloud. Uh, adopting a cloud native approach or even some of the less uh, less immediate approaches, uh, less extreme approaches I guess I should say, are that you move to a microservice type development model where you'll have tens, maybe hundreds of generally really loosely coupled services that could be written in several different languages. Uh, and so because of this, the way that requests move through your system, the way that each transaction gets handled is unpredictable. It can change over time. Right? A request that, you know, the past request that went through instance A, then B, then C on your next time could go through instances D, Q, and Y. And you really need something that can tell you for each transaction where this transaction went and what happened in each of those places. Also, the more you adopt cloud-first models, the more that you're going to start using dynamic, short-lived infrastructure. Uh, you know, serverless functions are becoming really popular, and they live on the order of seconds most of the time. Uh, even if you're not using serverless, you know, using a regular cloud-based infrastructure as a service system, you're still going to run into situations where your machines are spun up and spun down very quickly based on load. That's part of the reason you're doing this cloud migration. So the the fact that this architecture is so dynamic and the fact that you're running so many services on it and you're using so much of this great stuff you get from the cloud really vastly increases how much you have to keep track of. The number of servers, the number of functions, the volume of objects, metrics, and data that you have to make sense of and that you're monitoring an observability system has to be able to derive value from increases significantly too. Uh, and then finally, there's generally a shift that organizations make when they move to the cloud that says the person or team who built the service is responsible for running the service. And that means not just running the service in the sense of getting it running, but also keeping it up and making sure it performs well. Uh, and so the old idea that you can just throw your code over the wall and now it's ops this problem, it doesn't really work in this model. Because it is so complicated, the people that wrote it need to be involved in fixing it uh, because the state is just so complicated that no one person can keep an accurate mental model. Right? You can't visualize how hundreds of services talk to each other when every single service can be changed every single day. Uh, there's just no way that one person can keep that in their head. So it does require a shift in how you understand your system and what sort of tools you need to get data from it. Well, we've talked a few times, you know, cloud adoption is accelerating. Everybody's run into the cloud. Everybody wants to get all these great benefits. There's a little bit of a catch here. Uh, you can see on the slide, 80% of CIOs in a McKinsey survey reported that even though they've done the cloud migration, they've moved their products to the cloud, they're not really getting the level of agility and business benefits that they expected. Uh, and there's a few reasons for this, but I think one of the biggest ones is just they weren't prepared for the complexity of moving to the cloud. And a lot of times probably weren't committed to really taking advantage of all of the things that the cloud can offer. Right? If you're in the rehost part of the cloud migration, right, you're not going to get all the same benefits as you would be if you were all the way to the other side of the, the chart that we showed you earlier. So like I've been alluding to the past couple of slides, right? the complexity that going to the cloud creates means that you require observability. Right? The old school sort of monitoring only solutions aren't enough. They can't keep track of the diverse nature of the applications you have installed, the fact that they could be running across your on-premises environment, across multiple public clouds, private clouds, serverless, you know, third parties that are also involved increasingly in applications. So as you move into the cloud, as you get those benefits, you require observability. It's not a nice to have, it's not an optional, it's something that you have to have. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about what observability means uh, here over the next couple of slides. So as we're sort of starting to define what observability is, uh, I think it's important to differentiate uh, the fact that Monitoring and observability are not at odds with each other. <laughs> observability isn't replacing monitoring. You still need monitoring in any sort of system. And the best way, I think, to describe this is really to show monitoring is a verb. Right? Monitoring is something that you do. I can monitor something. I can get data from it. I can determine the state of how something's performing by looking at you know, metrics, by looking at things like that. Observability is a thing that you have. It's a noun. It's a property of your system. Your system is observable. Uh, and 
the system being observable lets you monitor your system, right? So observability is sort of, you can think of it as a mindset or a practice that enables you to do monitoring. So you can figure out what is running, what sort of data does it offer me, and then once you have that data ingested into the system, you can find patterns in it. You can see your error rates, you can see your durations, you can see how many requests go through, your business metrics, all of that good stuff. Uh, and you can find patterns in those, and you can figure out how your application is performing, how your business is performing over time, and then you can take actions to change that. So you can say, hey, our customers are abandoning the cart after you know this page loads. Why? Right? And you can figure out what's going on in your application, and you can even figure out what's going on in the user's browsers, right? Like you can see the whole view, but you can only take these actions, find these patterns, and do this monitoring work if your system is observable, right? So if you have observability, it's a thing that you have, not a thing that you do. Monitoring is a thing that you do. Uh, and I think it's just important that we share this with all of you so that when you're evaluating these systems, you, you really have to realize, like, you're not going to replace monitoring. Monitoring is not going away. Uh, it's still something you have to do, but observability enables you to do it better. So we talk about observ observability as a noun, right? It's something you have. Well, how do you get it? Uh, there's three sort of classical pillars of observability uh, that if you have these things, generally your system is considered to be observable. So they are metrics, traces, and logs. And each thing is necessary because each thing gives you a different view into how your system is performing. Metrics are very familiar to everyone, CPU usage, disk utilization. Uh, you know, memory utilization, all that kind of stuff, those are metrics. They're numbers that tell you what is going on. Right? You get a value that is unambiguous and is very clear. Traces tell you where things are going wrong. Right? So a trace, for example, would be if you have a web request come through, it goes through some sort of front end, it goes to a business logic service, it goes to a back end database. The traces let you see which one of those services this request went through and how it performed in all of those places. And so you can use the traces to find where your requests are going and then to figure out if they're failing, if they're slow, what sort of issues they're having. And then finally, you use logs to figure out why there are problems. Right? A trace showing you that server X gave you a 500 is useful, but it's not as useful as being able to pull up the log and see that it got a 500 because there's a null pointer exception somewhere in your code. Right? So to have observability, you really need to have all three of these things. You know, just one isn't enough, two isn't enough. All three of them are necessary to make sure that you can assess a problem, that you can monitor the state of your system from any sort of angle and uh, due to any sort of issue. So you really do need to have all three of these things. And if you look up observability research, you know, everybody else says the same thing. So comparing observability to traditional monitoring, there's you know, several use cases where observability we think really is required. Uh, you know, it's not just a nice to have, it's something you must have. Uh, and some of those are cloud migration, and that's including it in this, in this presentation, but you know, having multiple clouds is a fact of life for most people when they do their cloud migration. Uh, you know, there are pros and cons to all of the services, but there's realistically, most of the time, you want to have options when you have your deployment. So you need to be able to monitor things across multiple cloud services. You want to be able to capacity plan for the cloud. You want to be able to manage your costs, and those are really two sides of the same coin. Uh, most cloud providers are significantly cheaper if you purchase compute in advance. Uh, whereas if you're using on-demand for everything, it's going to become very expensive very fast. So using an observability tool can help you capacity plan your reservations and manage the cost of those reservations. Monitoring cloud services, too, generally requires a more advanced tool than some of the classic monitoring-only systems. Uh, cloud services, Kubernetes, serverless, KPIs, all of these things generally aren't monitored well by old school things. So you need something that is built for the cloud and understands how these cloud services operate. Kubernetes and containers especially are, are so complex and have so many layers of abstraction that you really need something that was built with the understanding of how that works and how that interplays with all the other parts of your architecture. 
And then finally, you know, optimizing your apps really requires you to have a full view into what the app does and how it performs. Modernizing your applications, looking at SLIs, SLOs, SLAs, uh, the continuous deployment integrations. You know, as you become more mature in your overall technology practice, observability is what gives you the data to make sure you're doing that with confidence and that you really feel like you're getting the benefits that you need and you're keeping the business happy at the same time. I've spoken about observability in general you know, throughout the past couple of slides, and now I want to take some time to talk about how Splunk views observability and how we can help you get observability of your systems. Uh, we think that it's really important that an observability system have three key features. Now, there's a lot of systems out there, but the things that are most essential to making sure you get all the benefits of adopting, adopting observability uh, are these. And the, the big one is you have to get all of the data. Right? There is so much data generated as part of a cloud migration like we talked about uh, earlier in this presentation, but you really have to be able to make sure you can get all of it. Right? Because architecture is so ephemeral, because the flows are so complicated, like if you're sampling, if you're missing out on data, you might lose visibility into huge parts of your infrastructure because you simply don't get the data into the observability system. And if you don't have the data, you can't monitor it. Right? There's no way for you to do any sort of evaluation of if it's a problem. There's no way for you to fix it because you simply don't have everything. So getting all of the data is probably the most critical thing. But your system also needs to be real-time and scalable. Right? You're going to be relying on this to provide you with that monitoring, to tell you when things are going wrong with your site, to tell you when your users are unhappy. Uh, and if your system doesn't operate in real time and all of this stuff is delayed by you know, minutes, uh, minutes in this world can, can lead to huge losses of customer goodwill, of money, if it's you know, a shopping application. Like, downtime isn't acceptable anymore, and your observability system really has to keep up with that. And because there is so much of this data, because the volume of data is going to grow significantly as you do, right, as you move more things to the cloud, as you adopt those, the complexity goes up, so the volume of data that needs to be analyzed goes up. Uh, we really feel like it's important that an observability system have a really robust support for built-in predictive analytics, machine learning, stuff to help you make sense of all of that data. Right? Showing you a dashboard that has thousands of lines updating every second doesn't do anything for you. Right? Your tool really needs to help make sense of what you're seeing and make sure that you can make reasonable decisions based on that. I won't stay on this slide for too long. I mostly wanted to include it to show you the sort of evolution that Splunk as a company has taken. You know, everybody's heard of us for our log investigation and log analysis tools, uh, but we've really tried to expand our scope and to really capture the data about applications from everywhere that you can think of. So if you look at our acquisition history over on the right part of the slide, you can see over time we've really been trying to make sure that we can capture things like security, analytics, machine learning, IoT, uh, network performance, and then real user monitoring, synthetics, web optimization. Right, so our company provides you with one platform that can monitor your on-premises stuff, your cloud infrastructure, your network, the APIs, cloud services, SaaS applications, user browsers, you know, networks all the way around the world. It can all be monitored all in one place by one company. We really feel like we have positioned ourselves in a way that anything you th can think of that will impact how your application runs, we can help you keep track of. So I just wanted to include this so that you can get a sense for the fact that we're building up our base of products, we're building up our expertise to really make sure that no data goes missing, <laughs> that you get all of the resources you need to figure out what's going on everywhere in your application, no matter where it's hosted. The common thing that uh, we hear at Splunk is that, you know, buying a product is expensive and I have all these engineers, we can just do it ourselves. We can adopt an open source product, you know, we can do a few little tweaks here and there, and then we'll have our own system that's tailored exactly for our needs. Uh, and, and that's true, you know, right, the open source products, there's nothing wrong with them, they're great products. Uh, but it is a very complicated universe to try to think of all of the things that an observability platform needs to provide. Right, this uh, 
eye chart that's up on your screen isn't even all of the components. Right? It's just some of the major components that you would need to replicate. Uh, so you have, of course, collection. right? You have infrastructure agents, application integrations, cloud service integrations, uh, tracing, injections, uh, you know, products, right? You have a data pipeline. So you need to move the data from one place to the other. You have an aggregator. You have storage. You have databases for all of these events. You have cloud databases that it stores things from the cloud. You have visualization and alerting things, right? You have metrics dashboards, traces dashboards, uh, and an alerting infrastructure. And those are all separate things, by the way, in open source solutions. Uh, and then you also have to have things like an API. You have to have a quota system so that you can figure out, you know, if somebody starts sending you a billion metrics that you can figure out who did it uh, and you know, get them to optimize their application. Right? Uh, your CI-CD integration has to be written from scratch. Right? So all of these things are doable, of course, uh, but they're complicated. And it realistically probably isn't the best use of the time of your engineers. Right? Engineers are so hard to find. We constantly hear there's a talent shortage, there's a talent shortage. And if there's a talent shortage, it may not be the best use of these rare engineers to have them re-implement something that you could just go buy. Right? Unless your monitoring is your core business, right, it probably makes more sense to have those people working on something that will drive your business further, that will give you more business value. So you know, DIY is fine. It's definitely doable. Uh, but it's something to really consider if that's the best use of the time of your engineering team and if they're sophisticated enough to be able to run all of these things with 24-7 uptime, uh, it's another thing you really have to consider when you're trying to roll your own observability platform. So obviously Splunk has a solution for this. <laughs> we call it Splunk Observability Cloud. Uh, there's a few key features that I'll talk about, and then I'll share all the components of the product. Uh, some of the key features, the biggest one, uh, for, in my opinion, is our unified user experience. Right. All of these different parts of the of the product uh, all have the same user interface. So once you've learned how to use one of them, you've learned how to use all of them, and they're linked into each other. So if you see something interesting in APM, something weird in your trace, right, you can click through to look at the underlying node or the underlying host in infrastructure monitoring. And then if you see you know something weird in there, you can click through to Log Observer, and you can see the direct log lines. Uh, you can even click over to Digital Experience, and you can see real user monitoring metrics around that same trace. Right? It's all in one place. It's all very easy for people to use. Uh, even people who st historically haven't used observability tools, like you know, the old school developers who never bothered to look at, uh, to look at the monitoring platform before, uh, if they use this one, uh, everything is easy to use and can be found in one place. Our system is also full fidelity enterprise scale, which are great marketing buzzwords, but really means that we can take all of your data. We do not sample. We don't throw anything away. Everything you send us gets used to provide those business insights, to provide that valuable data that is the reason you buy this product in the first place. Uh, and we can scale arbitrarily. We have customers that are sending us on the order of petabytes of metrics, traces, and logs a day, uh, and we can handle that. So as your organization grows, we can grow with you without any problems. We also use OpenTelemetry as our native data source for all of our components. Uh, so if you decide you don't like the product, you want to go somewhere else, totally fine. You don't have to redo any of the instrumentation work. Right? You've already instrumented with OpenTelemetry, and you can use it with other vendors with no issues. Also, all of the OpenTelemetry agents uh, and instrumentation libraries are all open source. So if you want to tweak them for your platform, if you want to make changes, you can easily do that. And like I said earlier, one of the things that is really critical to having an observability system versus just a simple, you know, more just monitoring only system is this idea of predictive analytics. And our platform does that. It can tell you, based on the trends of a data point, if an alert is likely to fire. So even before an alert is going to go on, like we can tell you, hey, if this keeps going the way it's going, in 20 minutes, it's going to alert. Right? So you can fix things before they even become problems. Uh, and we also use this to automatically identify outliers as far as traces, as far as infrastructure, uh, as far as hosts and infrastructure monitoring. Right? We can tell you something looks weird here uh, so that you're not spending your time looking at a bunch of stuff that says everything's normal. Right? There's no point in having a normal dashboard. You want to see the stuff that's not normal. So our predictive analytics capabilities let you do that. The components of the of the product are you can see up on the slide, right? We have application performance monitoring, which gives you your traces. It lets you see how things are flowing uh, throughout your application. Infrastructure monitoring, which shows you the health and activity on all of your hosts. 
uh, whatever that infrastructure lies, right? So on-prem, public cloud, private cloud, you can see it there. Uh, log investigation is called Log Observer. It's a very simple tool, uh, but it's powerful, but it's not something you need to learn a query language to use. Right? It's tied into everything else in the suite. So if you see a trace come up that you want to find the logs for, it's just two clicks away, and boom, there you are in the logs, and you can see what's going on there. Incident response provides on-call management. So when an incident occurs, when there's an issue, uh, it automatically alerts the correct person the first time so that they can fix it without having everybody be on conference bridges all night. Uh, and it really makes developers and operations people happier because they're only getting things that they need to fix, that they need to fix. Uh, and then the final component is called digital experience monitoring. It's our real user metrics product and synthetic monitoring. So you can see what's going on in your users' devices and network conditions and issues all the way around the world. You can also check the health of your applications with a full-in browser, right? so it can do anything that a real user can do. Uh, and you can use that as part of your CI-CD system to see how your changes impact actual users. So there's a ton of power here, a lot more than I can fit on one slide, uh, but it's really something that gives you a turnkey observability monitoring product all in one place. This is what's called a service map, and it's a flagship feature of our application performance monitoring product. Uh, lots of our competitors will show you a similar thing, but it's not nearly as fully featured as our product is. What you can see on this service map is a real-time outline of how your services talk to each other. So we didn't have to set this up. We didn't have to link these together. Like Our product discovers how these services interact and graphs it for you. You can also see these red dots on here that demonstrate where there are failures. Right. So you have a failure at the very front end service all the way over on the left, but then as you can follow these arrows across, you can find the root cause of your failures. Uh, in seconds, right, just by looking at this heat map, you can see where the problems are in what service. Then, because of our infinite cardinality, you can look at a particular service, and you'll see this pop-up window that shows you the red metrics. You have your rate, errors, and durations. You have your SLI objectives. right? You have your latencies, that sort of thing, um, in percentiles. And then you can also use that infinite cardinality to show you say, different versions of the backend service or different availability zones or regions or pretty much anything you can think of, you can slice and dice this by to really quickly narrow down where problems are happening. Uh, and so a lot of platforms say they have a service map, but a lot of them make you either manually specify the service links, which is basically worthless, <laughs> or they can't show you downstreams. They can't cascade that data back up to show you the effect it's having on the front end of your experience. So really dig into service mapping when you're looking at APM tools. The takeaway from this, it's something that's really vital, and it's something that you'll spend a lot of your time in once you have one of these tools, because it helps you troubleshoot and find issues so quickly. So I've talked a lot about smoke observability, but I really wanted to end this part of the presentation with just one slide. You can remember why this product, why do you need this? Right? And the real answer is this, but Splunk Observability lets you use all of your data and leave no question unanswered. We can answer anything you want to know about your application. We do this by ingesting all of your data at any scale. Unlimited cardinality, you can slice and dice it however you feel like you need to. And we also give you no schema streaming logs. No schema for anything, really. Right? When you send us a metric, you just send us a timestamp and a number, and we figure it out. Logs, you can send us completely unstructured data. Again, we figure it out. That's what you're paying us for. We use open standards for our data collection and instrumentation. We are the founder and leading contributor to the Open Telemetry Project. Uh, this is the second most active Cloud Native Computing Foundation project, uh, second only to Kubernetes, so I think we're doing a good job there. Uh, but the Open Telemetry integration is really important because when you are pitching this to the people who have to do the work of integrating the product, this is the only time they'll have to integrate. Right? They integrate one time with OpenTelemetry, and then you can take your data wherever you want. You can move to any other platform, and we really we don't want to lock you in. We want you to use our product because it's the best product. Uh, and a lot of other people say they support OpenTelemetry, but look at their commits. Look at their activity. Right? Nobody comes close to what Splunk is doing to make this product work and to make it be better. And finally, one of the really key takeaways here is that this gives you answers and action. It's not just the data. There's too much data to make sense of it on yourself. 
you really need to have something that helps tell you what's important. So we have AI-driven directed troubleshooting, intelligent response, and there's even ways that you can automate responses so that when something comes up, you can kick off a job that will try to fix it, right? and only if it can't fix it itself will it alert someone. So Splunk Observability provides you with everything that you need to see the entire state of your system all in one place. With that, I want to hand this over to Brian, who's going to talk about Google Cloud in a little bit more detail so you can learn how to get some of these great cloud migration benefits by moving to Google Cloud. So go ahead and take it away, Brian. Thank you, Greg. So yeah, as Greg mentioned, I'm going to talk about how you can get this observability and migrate to Google Cloud. We'll cover kind of a quick mapping of what those five R's are and what services they may map to within Google Cloud. It's, uh, it's not a hard and fast mapping, but uh, we'll get right into that. So if you take a look at the journey I've kind of created on this slide, I combined two of the R's, the rehost and revise. Uh, this is kind of the, the lift and shift that Greg had mentioned earlier. Uh, if you see towards the bottom there, I put Google Cloud VMware Engine further on the left. And that's because if you're running an on-premise environment, for instance, it's probably more of a lift and shift to take your current VMware environment, run it on Google Cloud, and not change it at all. A little further down that line, I put Compute Engine. And that's actually changing your hypervisor, right? Using Google's native hypervisor within GCP. Uh, and, and that kind of puts you more towards the revised section, but uh, you know, not further along yet. And then as you kind of look down here, we have the refactor, rebuild, and replace sections. You can see a mapping of some of the Google Cloud services I've put here. As I mentioned previously, these aren't hard mappings. This isn't as simple as like an IaaS, PaaS, or SaaS model where everything uh, maps nice and easily. It really does depend on your application, what you're trying to do, et cetera. But this is just kind of trying to put some services to the different parts of the journey at the five R's. Uh, once you look at the rebuild section, that's when you really are looking at containers. So I put GKE there, our Kubernetes engine, to help manage that. And then in Anthos to really make that a multi-cloud or hybrid environment to really get the benefits of the migration there. Lastly, on the far right, we do have the replace. As mentioned earlier, this is more of your SaaS services, so I listed a couple of SaaS services that are on Google Cloud there. And that's the full migration where you don't want your engineering, DevOps, uh, SRE teams really working, maintaining, and scaling an application, but you want to hand that off. So we're going to take a deeper look at Anthos and why we believe this is one of our leading strategies in terms of migration to the cloud and taking the full benefit of the cloud. So as you can see here, I've kind of put uh, where Anthos can run. And, and the reason for this is at Google, we're asked a lot, how can I run my company like Google runs their company, run their apps, their services? They want to adapt. Uh, adopt a modern developer and SRE practice similar to what Google does. And for the last few years up until Anthos was released, Google talked about it but didn't really have a great answer. We didn't give the people who asked this question an easy path forward or a path forward unless they wanted to build a bunch of services themselves. Our answer back then was come to Google Cloud, use our services like BigQuery, Dataflow, GKE, our Kubernetes engine, App Engine Data Store, things like that. And this will rid you of infrastructure toil and allow your developers to focus more on what matters. And this is what Google does internally. But that wasn't a good enough answer. We wanted to give our customers a, to, a, a better way. We can't force you to both change your apps and move to the cloud at the same time. That's kind of attacking multiple dimensions, right? You're attacking two dimensions at the same time, which puts you at a much higher risk. So our answer for this is Anthos. What basically we've done is we've separated Google Cloud into a control plane, which is the Anthos control plane, and the deployment targets themselves, whether that's GCP, on-prem, or other clouds. Uh, this idea with Anthos is to standardize our customers on the same set of tools across any of these locations and create a single pane of glass. It's kind of a universal control plane that can cover any of these locations. 
So when we talk about Anthos, we need to talk about the stack and what actually makes up Anthos. So what's listed on this slide and what I've put here is a few of the services that kind of make up Anthos. And we'll, we'll go over some of these and kind of show what they are. So Istio on the left side there is our service ops SRE type tool. It organizes your microservices into a service mess. And this is where traffic control is decoupled from the infrastructure. Knative is, enables a serverless experience on top of any Kubernetes distro. Uh, it kind of enables the benefits of a serverless PaaS or FAS type service without locking you in. It, it's really built for the developers who don't want to learn and operate Kubernetes or Istio, and that's where it comes into play. Uh, Cloud Run on the right side is a fully managed serverless product. It is compatible with Knative. So what this means is you can rapidly scale from zero to whatever you need to, zero to N. It supports HTTP and gRPC calls and has a built-in domain and DNS management. Uh, we have Cloud Run for Anthos, so it's a slightly different version of Cloud Run, and it kind of unlocks the experience and runs wherever Knative and Anthos will run. And then the last one I'll talk about here is the Anthos Config Manager. That is really the GitOps automation for fleets of your Kubernetes clusters. So you're going to synchronize configs across cl clusters that are on-prem or in the cloud and continuously enforce the compliance of those policies. It enables end-to-end -end auditability and peer review through policy as a code. So it's pretty powerful. So shifting gears a little bit, I wanted to talk about Splunk Cloud on Google Cloud as a SaaS offering. Uh, it is offered across the globe today. You can see in the slide here the, the thin points to show you kind of where it is. So in the US, it's in Iowa for Splunk Cloud. We do have Observability Cloud in other regions in the US highlighted with the, the dropped pins there. We have services available in Europe, Australia, APAC, and there's more services coming along all the time. So Splunk can really meet you where you need to be with your, uh, your deployment of observability and cloud. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I just wanted to really quickly share with all of you uh, some of the things that you get with Splunk Observability and Google Cloud. So out of the box with Splunk Observability Cloud, uh, if you have a Google integration, you'll see this dashboard shows up right away. And it includes a heat map at the top of your Compute Engine instances. So you can see uh, their overall workload, their overall health. You can see a count of instances. You can see your rate error duration metrics. You can see how those are changing over time. You can even see like the type of uh, engines that you have allocated to your instances. Uh, all of this stuff is all in one place. It's all out of the box. So you can see a huge array of data about your Google Cloud infrastructure all in one place. I've explained a few times how important open telemetry is. Uh, the real reason this slide is here is that you know, the way you get data in from Google is the same as you get it in from anywhere else. You use open telemetry. Uh, there are integrations built in that use open telemetry format for a lot of the Google products. So Google Operation Suite, which you might know as Stackdriver, uh, has a Splunk observability integration. Uh, you just need to look for signal effects. We haven't changed all of our branding yet, but it, it is there. Uh, and then there's also Istio integration that gives you out-of-the-box visibility into how your microservices are performing uh, and to the health of your service mesh as a whole. Right? And this also, of course, works with Anthos, uh, like anything else that was made for Istio. We also have wrappers available for cloud functions so that you can observe those easily also. Uh, it's something that you can just integrate with a few lines of code and be able to see everything that's going on all in one place. And again, all of the open telemetry agents are all open source, so you can customize and contribute, configure them however you want to, and it makes sure that you own your data. You can take it to any other platform at any other time. And that'll do it for our presentation. We do have a couple of resources that we want to show you here on the next slide that tell you what you can do next. So you can start today. We have both uh, Google and Splunk make it easy for you to get started and experience this for yourself. Uh, from the Splunk side, if you want to learn about Splunk Observability Cloud, if you want to start a trial, just go to splunk.com slash Ali. That's uh, observability, you know, abbreviated the way that, that the tech industry likes to do. Splunk.com slash the letter O, one, one, Y. 
Uh, and then if you're interested in learning more about how you can operate Splunk on Google Cloud, check out cloud.google.com slash Splunk. So now that we've told you what your next steps are, uh, we want to say thank you so much for coming to this webinar. Uh, we really hope you got a lot of value from it and that now you understand some of the, the nuance between monitoring and observability, some of the approaches you can take to migrate your applications to the cloud, uh, the strengths and weaknesses of those approaches, and then how Google Cloud can help you power that migration. Uh, so we really hope you enjoyed our time, and thank you again for attending. Awesome. Well, thank you so very much for that amazing presentation. Um, I know Greg was in the chat um, answering many of your questions. Um, cool. And uh, so if you've got any uh, other questions, feel free, pop those right into the Q&A tab there, and we will get those answered for you as well, folks. Um, all right. Oh, you're very welcome. We got a lot of thank yous coming in. So thank you for attending. Um, it is time now to remind you that, um, oh, look, here's a question right now. I'm going to throw this out here. Um, do we need the same kind of observability for all five R's? Let's see, Greg, are you, uh, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, I, I think um, I think one of the things that is interesting about observability is that you really use it for any sort of situation where you want to figure out what's going on. So uh, yeah, I'd say observability is appropriate for all five of them. Um, the extent to which a commercial observability tool is necessary may be a little different, right? If you're sort of just doing the lift and shift rehost, it's maybe not as important to use an observability product, um, but you need to have the mindset, right? So it's still valuable. If you're going all the way into purchasing new products and rehosting and rebuilding everything, you're gonna want an observability product, right? As you adopt a microservice model, um, you really need to be able to uh, see what's going on with your services, right? So you really need a product that's designed for observability at that point. Yeah. All right. Um, can you, are all cloud infrastructures the same? This kind of seems like a, a, this is an interesting one. I'm, I'm interested to know what your answer is going to be. Uh, well, I think, I think Brian might have an opinion on that. But, uh, from, from my perspective, they all, they all provide similar things uh, in different ways, uh, and they're optimized a little bit differently for different workloads, right? So not all cloud infrastructure is identical, of course, but um, there are they're all going to provide you with a compute resource. They're going to provide you with a storage resource. They're going to provide you with a load balancing resource, right? So um, they're not all identical, of course, uh, but they do have a lot of things in common. So if you're thinking about which cloud infrastructure do you want to go to, um, the things you really want to look for are uh, pricing, obviously, is going to be an important one, uh, their availability and their performance, uh, where they're located in relation to your users, uh, you know, uh, how they handle data privacy. You know, there's a lot of concepts that are going to be slightly different between all of them. Uh, and there's also like how much of giving you power out of the box they do, right? Like certain cloud providers have a really mature ecosystem around stuff like Kubernetes, right? Like GKE is a world-class uh, tool, right? But uh, certain other cloud providers, uh, like Azure, for instance, um, you can run Kubernetes in Azure, but it's going to be a little bit more painful than if you did it with Google. So, uh, Brian, go ahead and take it away, man. Yeah, I, I think, Greg, you summed it up pretty well. Sorry, people, my uh, mic wasn't turning back on for some reason for a while. Um, you know, in essence, you know, as Greg said, you are getting a, a virtual machine or a container, you're getting a load balancer, you're getting some storage, whether that be object or block storage, things like that. So those parts are very similar. Those nuances are, you know, very minute uh, with what they are and how they operate. Some are easier to operate than others, obviously. But in terms of logging, visibility, things like that, it is pretty similar on that front. Uh, but how you create your architecture could change from cloud to cloud. 
For instance, Google is the only cloud that has a globally scoped network, meaning that your VPC network is global. So you can have automatic routing and firewall rules within one VPC and span that across multiple regions around the world. So then your infrastructure is different there, right? Uh, we're the only ones that have what we call a global load balancer. So then your customers would hit this virtual load balancer that is closest to them and get routed automatically to your infrastructure in the back end of Google Cloud that is also closest to them instead of creating different VPC networks, attracting it different ways with DNS, things like that. So while the, the basic nuts and bolts are the same, there are definitely um, large nuances as well. Yeah. Okay. All right, folks. Um, we've got a couple of minutes till the top of the hour, um, and we do need to start wrapping up. So um, if we did not get to your question, please know we're going to uh, take these questions and send them over to uh, Brian and Greg. They'll be able to follow up with you afterwards. Um, I just need to go through my housekeeping items, and then I believe we have a quick drawing for our Amazon gift card winners. So please remember that this session has, be, has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, you'll be able to go back and watch it again. We will send you an email with instructions for accessing the webinar on demand. So keep an eye on your inbox for that. All right, so now our Amazon gift card winners today are Tom T, Jose C, Young K, and Lenka K. Congratulations to our winners. We will send you an email with instructions for claiming your gift card. So keep an eye on your inbox for that. And if you don't see it, please make sure and check your spam folders. Uh, again, as I said, we're going to take um, any questions that we did not get to right now. We're going to send them over to Brian and Greg. They'll be able to follow up with you offline. Folks, thank you so much for joining us. And Greg and Brian, thank you so much for the amazing presentation and uh, for all of your awesome insight. We really appreciate it. And we hope to see you again at another DevOps.com webinar. I am Sharon Florentine, signing off.